on to the final part of our adventure. By now, you've probably got the hang of our combat, puzzle, narrative, reward method, or CPNR method if you like, of analyzing dungeon encounters, so we should be able to blaze through the rest of the rooms and discuss how they create the level as a whole. First, we have the master bedroom. Its combat component? None. Its puzzle component? Traps, and a lock that can't be picked, leading the player to start searching for a key. Its narrative component? This is clearly the room of the former ruler of this place, or his lady. It's opulent and inviting. The traps are still intact, and the clothes are even still hung up in the closet, but nobody's here. It's as if they vanished, leading the player to wonder what could have happened to them. Also, note that there are traps on everything. Not only the treasure chest, but also the bureau and the drawers. Whoever was here was paranoid, and yet something got them. As for the reward, you'll find one of the best sets of armor in the game here. It clearly belonged to whomever once lived in this room. Also, some grapes, in case you want some grapes. Moving south, we get to the gym. Its combat component, flesh golems, and another skeleton warrior. This serves as a difference in kind. The designers know that the player just left a room without a combat encounter. Also, it has an exciting new enemy type that the player hasn't seen before. This encounter is also a pulling exercise. The flesh golems hit really hard, and they're fairly accurate, but they aren't that tough. The skeleton warrior has a huge amount of health and high resistances. If the player pulls all of these monsters at once, they're in for a rough fight. But if they can pull one at a time down this corridor, which is clearly set up for pulling, they'll be just fine. The room's puzzle component? None. Its narrative component? The tower's occupants were, apparently, using flesh golems as sparring partners. Its reward component? Another magic two-handed sword. After this, we have a connected hallway with a door to the north and a passage to the east. We're gonna head east. This room's combat component? None. Its puzzle component? Here we have a giant wine press that needs to be powered, starting off your next mini-quest, figuring out how to power this thing. Also, a player who's thinking carefully will probably see how this might play into one of the riddles given at the start. The grapes they were given earlier should help the player make the connection. Its narrative component? Well, this place once had a powered wine press, which would make it probably the most luxurious and self-sufficient place on the entire Sword Coast. Its reward component? None yet, at least not until you power the wine press. Now let's head through that door in the hallway. This leads to a room with a giant engine in it. Its combat component? None. Its puzzle component, clearly this is what you need to power the press, but the switch turns out to be missing. Better go find that. Its narrative component, none. Its reward component will be turning on the press when you fix the switch. There's also a secret door in this room, which leads to a small trapped hallway and another secret door. Let's follow that into the treasure room. Combat component, two skeletons and a skeleton warrior. The only thing to note here is that if you explored the floor in the other direction, you would encounter this room before the sitting room where we had our first encounter with that powerful skeleton warrior. This is a much more muddled way to introduce the skeleton warrior, what with these other weaker guys flanking him. Not really ideal. A somewhat better design choice might have been to simply mirror the sitting room encounter and only have the skeleton warrior in this room. It would mean having two nearly identical encounters, but it still probably leads to a better play experience on average. Okay, so for this room's puzzle component, you find an odd key. Remember that locked drawer in the master bedroom? I wonder if these go together. Also, there's a strange-looking gem that's easy to miss buried with the other random sellable gems in this pile, but if you examine it, its item description literally starts with, This stone seems to be completely out of place down here, almost as if it wasn't a coincidence after all. Perhaps it has some meaning, maybe even a purpose here. As for narrative, the people who lived here had a lot of treasure, but it never got spent. The reward component? Tons of minor rewards. This is the room filled with goodies for the player to enjoy, even if most of them are still consumables. But the real reward in this room is the gem and the odd-looking key. Now, you've all probably already figured out the MicroQuest puzzle here, but the key opens the drawer, the drawer contains a lever, the lever starts the engine, the engine fires up the press, the press turns the grape you have into wine, and voila, you have the answer to another one of the riddles. Turns out that the wine was the answer to the dwarf's love riddle. The sword was the answer to the pride riddle. The gem is for avarice, and as many of you have probably guessed, ringing the gong answered the final riddle, fear. So with all that, let's head back to the starting area. We'll traverse through the kitchen, which has no combat or puzzle component. The narrative component is simply that a lot of people died in this kitchen, perhaps of poison. And the reward is more basic consumables. This area is really here just to serve as a secondary hub. The areas you can't access directly from the main hall, you can access pretty directly from this room, limiting the traversal time required of the player. And once we're through the kitchen, it's back to the delving room. 
Here, rather than getting a traditional reward for the quest, the game explodes into one of the most hectic and difficult fights you will find in all of Baldur's Gate. Love talks about how he must be killed to move on, this being the room's new narrative component, and then all of the quest givers descend on the party. Two of them are warriors, one of them's a rogue, and one of them's a magic user, each with their own unique abilities. On top of that, the fight begins with a cloud kill spell going off in the room, which can instantly kill members of the player's party if they don't get out of the way. The most interesting thing about this boss fight is that there are many ways to approach it. Many of the combat encounters on this floor highlighted some specific aspect of play, whereas this boss fight simply takes the approach of, here is a very, very difficult combat problem. Solve it however you can. It takes place in a big open room, but the player can easily retreat to a tight corridor if they want. The enemies are varied here, so there's incentive for both spellcasting and melee. The health of the enemies in the encounter is distributed across four characters, so there is an argument to be made for getting them to clump up and AoE attacking them, but also for picking them off one at a time and reducing the abilities they have available and the damage coming in. And so, with one tough but satisfying boss fight, we have finished the first floor. Now let's look at how all of this fits together. We've basically got three corridors, a north corridor, a middle corridor, and a south corridor. The adventure took place in the north and south corridors while the middle one served as a hub to allow the player to rapidly traverse the level. Both the north and south corridors are separated out into micro hub areas, each of which was tied together in a micro quest in such a way that when the player had fully explored all the spokes of a micro hub, they had completed the first quest, with the exception of the gong quest, which itself was divided up into even smaller sub quests. Upon entering this floor, the player was given an overarching goal to complete. But importantly, this overarching goal was segmented into four pieces. This allowed the designers to create a series of micro-quests without having to resort to scattering quest givers all over the place. Quests which they could then divvy up amongst the micro-hub areas they'd created. The flow of these micro-hubs, basically the way that the player naturally moves through the area because the designers have dead-ended all the other options, takes the player in a circuit around the north and south corridors, and then brings them back to the middle of the floor, which is connected to almost every micro-hub. The larger narrative component of this entire floor gives a rising sense of mystery and dread, until at last the player thinks something positive will occur because they've solved a quest for love, only to have all of their hopes dashed and be told that they must kill love in this place, taking the game to a dark place real quick and preparing the player for what's yet to come. And with that, we have finally completed the first floor of Durlag's Tower. Thank you all for sticking with us. I hope you have enjoyed this deep dive into this wonderful example of dungeon design, and I hope that the combat puzzle narrative reward method, or CPNR method, of encounter design will give you another tool in your tool belt to help you examine the games you play and to hone the games you create. So, in that vein, if any of you would like to pick up where we're leaving off and make a response video using this method to examine floor 2 of Durlag's Tower, James is gonna try, assuming we don't get too flooded, to look at your videos personally and to offer a bit of feedback in the comments. Once again, thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time.